pleasure to be back here. Thank you for um, inviting me to be here. And um, as Scott said, I'm here today to talk about Gold Spotted Oak Bar. And um, I understand that some of you might have been introduced to um, maybe a couple years ago to a presentation about Gold Spotted Oak Bar, so you may be somewhat familiar. So really, a lot of this information I'm going to zip through kind of quickly, but. We'll leave room at the end for um, questions, and um, you know, I'm here more for the update to let you know what's going on in, in research and um, what our latest strategy, management strategies are. So the goal spot of OPAR, quickly I'm going to be introducing or talking about its background in the biology impact and management options. I do want to mention that a lot of the images that you'll see here and a lot of the research information that I'll be sharing comes from Dr. Tom Coleman, who's an entomologist with the USDA Forest Service, the um, Family Health Protection, Forest Health Protection Unit, and he's based out of San Bernardino. So um, that's a name you'll probably see frequently related to Gold Spotted Oak Bar, who's Tom Coleman. So here's a picture. Um, it's on most every publication that we have <laughs> regarding Gold Spotted Oak Bar. Um, it's, uh, Latin name, Agrilus argentatus. Um, in the early, at the beginning, when it was first um, discovered in 2008 in the Cleveland National Forest, it was first thought to be related to a species that came from south, southern Mexico and Central America. Um, since then, um, through DNA testing, it's been um, identified most with the species in southeastern Arizona. So that may be a change in Latin name um, from before when you heard about it. Just in case you want to know the difference. So what this test does, it's an invasive, non-native insect test, and it burrows through, it lays its eggs in the bark in the crevices, and it burrows through the um, outer bark and um, basically feeds in that cambium layer, which is kind of the vascular system for the tree. Um, it doesn't go into the hardwood. You'll see not in here. It won't burrow into the hardwood here, into the xylem. But it just, you'll see evidence of attack if you remove the bar where you see slices of um, oak. Right here, you start to spot our evidence of the attack. So again, we think um, we're pretty certain, researchers are pretty certain that it comes from um, southeastern uh, Arizona and that moved to that Descanso, that inland area of uh, San Diego County. And from there, moved to um, a location near La Jolla and Marion Bear Park on the 52 freeway, and then, from, and then also from the um, Descanso or that general area um, up to Idlewild. So it's, it's been identified in the Cleveland National Forest first, and then um, has been further identified throughout that area. So Descanso, uh, Julian, Pine Valley, Hamul, Petrero, Campo, Ramona, um, going the north into um, the, the Santa Isabel area, and along Warner Springs. Um, and then there's a jump up to Idaho, the Riverside County. So although there's been a lot of monitoring throughout not only the Southern California counties, but even up in the, um, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Um, in the Sierra Nevadas, it has not been found. We haven't found a positive identification in any other county other than San Diego County and um, Riverside. And just in Riverside County, only in that Isle of Wight area. So what's highly suspected with these big jumps, these big leaps, in distance is that it is being moved um, by human sources through movement of firewood. So I will continually come back to that point. I really want to make that um, clear on, on pretty much how we think it was introduced to California. So it does attack oak species, um, in particular red oak species. So um, coast live oak, California black oak most specifically. Um, also, canyon live oak. If it's in a highly infested area, it's been known to attack Engelman oak, but um, we have not found it to cause oak mortality within Engelman oak. 
Um, but where you see a mix of these species, um, Engelman oak with these other species, is not as common as you would see these two species. Um, and, and these are the species that are most heavily attacked. Um, it attacks, it likes the larger diameter sized trees. And this is just some um, data, maybe more than you need to know, but um, just some research that was done, some ground surveys that were done um, in the Cleveland National Forest. So you'll see on um, the smaller diam DBH, diameter at rest height, um, that the larger the trees are, the higher impact that this pest has. Is there um, a theory about that thing? About what the best? Why it likes the older trees? Okay. Um, the only thing I've heard, and it's, and it's guessing, <laughs> is that the, the larger trees um, certainly are a larger food source um, for the pest, but um, thicker bark and it's, it's more protected, under, especially in coast live oak. If you look, the bark is really thick and, and um, that's the difference from the oak trees that it's attacking here versus the oak trees that it's attacking in, in Arizona. Um, so they're attacking different oak species and they're biology, the makeup of those trees is just very different. Plus there's some credit, natural predators that are um, helping to contain the populations in Arizona too. And I'll touch on that later. So um, you'll see, you know, 10, 10 inches or, or higher, um, it really jumps to the um, impact that it has as far as injuring trees or um, actually causing mortality. So based on that research, um, they're pretty much determined that 18 inches, 20 inches on these species, California black oak and coast live oak, are the trees that are the greatest, at greatest risk. But you can see it'll attack even, you know, down to 7 inch diameter. It's been found, 14 inches in diameter. So when we're looking at oak trees, we don't want to dismiss just because it's a smaller tree. You know, we don't want to dismiss looking at it just because it's a smaller tree, because it has been found and known to so, uh, Again, this is just a repeat, but um, just some photos of the, you know, what this looks like in, um, in the field. And it takes several years of feeding for an oak tree to die, because there's only one generation per year. And um, basically what happens is, I'll get to the picture, but it'll get into that layer, that flown layer, and um, just slowly start, just repeated attacks over the years, and slowly start hurtling the tree, and, and um, causing the injury that way. So this is just um, some maps showing the progression. 2002-2004 um, is on the left, and 2002 through 2012. So you can see the increase, and um, this doesn't show the La Jolla or the Marion Fair, um, yeah, you can see it's gotten quite thick of the red are the infested, known infested areas. So our concern is, is that there's a lot more out there that has been infested that we just don't know about. Um, here's a more current map. Um, all these areas that have been monitored, um, the green, uh, it has not been found present there yet. Um, and then the other colors here, the red and the orange and the yellow, are all areas that it has been identified positively. Or the yellow actually is a su it's suspect that that is, because um, it's in the middle of those highly infested areas. Because it takes several years for a tree to die, um, or even um, a couple years before injury is, is starting to be evident, and symptoms are seen, you know, if it's if it's in a location within a known infested area, then it's going to be suspected that those trees are going to be impacted or have been already. So this this map does show this is that area right in here on the 52. I don't know if you're familiar there along Claremont and University City, and then just Idlewild in the Pine Cove area. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> greater concern we have for this pest is all of all the other oak borers and natural enemies that the oak trees have. You know, oaks have been fairly, are fairly resilient even through wildfire. 
um, nothing else has shown the kind of impact or caused the kind of um, an intensive mortality that this pest has. Um, and the concern is that, as you can see from this map, what this is showing is um, the distribution of these species throughout the state and actually goes up into Southern California as well. So the potential, the threat for this to spread up throughout the state. The green is coast by oak and the purple is um, California Bucko and Canyon Live Oak. So, um, you know, oak trees are, are just a huge part of California's ecosystems. And so it's not just um, the impact to aesthetics or to just certain types of property owners, such as public lands or private property owners um, or tribal lands. Um, you know, it's, it's also the cost of what the unknown cost and impact that this could have to an entire ecosystem and different ecosystems throughout the state. Also, some of you, I mean, you may have heard of the sudden oak death, and that is along the coast down to Monterey, northern California, down to Monterey. Um, there's one symptom of GSAW that may seem similar to that of sudden oak death, and that's the bleeding that you may see the discharge of tree and bark, but we're not, I've been told umpteen times. Um, I'm not a biologist or a pathologist um, or botanist, but I've been told umpteen times that sudden oak death is not going to be here. It may have been found, but it's not going to have the impact that we're seeing in Northern California just because of the climate issues. Um, it's a, a pathogen, a disease, and needs certain, um, certain circumstances, climatic circumstances. So. So these are the life stages from larvae in that tiny area right there. Um, so it, it grows from a really small size to um, quite large, to, you know, to 200 centimeters, I believe. 20 centimeters, I think that's 20 centimeters. And then as it, it matures, it'll go into this um, hairpin formation, and, and then it gets to pupate, and this is the female, this is the male. So um, it causes its most injury while it's feeding when it's in the smallest stage. Um, and most likely, it's, it's highly improbable that you would see the adults in the field if you were out and about, although it's not impossible. Because I was just associated with a, um, a, a tour and, and training out at Queen of State Park, and one of the participants in that class one landed on her thigh. Picture with the perfect. Um, so all along we're saying you're never, you know, you're not going to see these in the field, and then here it was right on her thigh. So. What's, the time, what's the time limit between that and that? Um, a year. I'll show you about a year, and, and I'll show you a life stage at the at a slide at the end, of the, so you can see um, the whole calendar. Um, again, the life cycle, what it'll do is say May and October, it'll um, lay its eggs and it'll burrow in through the um, bark and then eating, 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 and then May and October, um, as it matures, May through October is, is the high flight season, is what we call So it'll create those D-shaped exit holes because it's a flathead bore, um, just by the shape of its head, it's going to create that D-shaped exit hole. And that the fly season can be anything they've been found to be in, in, in flight and feeding between May and October. And that's a long fly season. So it's a primary um, attacker, if you will. Meaning it's not the tree does not have to be stressed for it to be attacked by GSOC. It causes the stress, which allows um, these other symptoms to, you know, severe crown thinning to happen which is a symptom of attack, um, dead patches of, of the cambium, um, and then you'll see evidence of other attacks by other um, insects, such as the oak bark beetles and other wood borders. So, you know, a lot of, I mean, certainly any time a tree is stressed, it's probably more, um, it's most likely to be more Susceptible to attack, I guess, yeah, that's the best word, susceptible to attack. I was going to say be attacked, no. Um, but GSOP causes the harsher injuries that, that cause it a more deafness. And then we, there has been um, studies with the drought 
looking at to see if there's a correlation between attack and the drought symptoms, and there's not been any correlation between that. Um, but we all know that drought does impact oak trees and fruit especially. So, oh, flaking off um, bark and, and um, other beetles. So the larval galleries, again, this is where it's causing the most of its impact. If you remove the bark, and, and again, with coast live oak, that's a pretty thick, you know, several inches, up to several inches of bark that can be removed. Um, you'll see these really meandering galleries. Um, if the tree has not completely died, then you'll see this brown, this dark, blackish brown frass within the galleries is excrement. Um, if the tree's been seasoned for a while, um, I've got samples in the office, but you'll still see these really, there's no rhyme or, or reason to the patterns. They're just meandering and squiggly all over the place. But it's that extensive feeding. You know, like I said, multiple years of attack and it just starts gurgling, going around the tree and killing that vascular system, keeping the nutrients um, from getting back to the tree. Um, other injury symptoms, the crown thinning I mentioned, the bark staining I mentioned, um, um, D-shaped exit holes is the most diagnostic symptom of uh, attack. And then woodpecker foraging is another one because it's trying to get to the larvae underneath. <coughs> Here's extensive, an image of an extensive G-shaped exit holes. All the red is just a mark of the, the um, exit hole. So when we say extensive attack, we mean extensive attack, um, or repeated attacks. And I, I think there's more than 100 here. There's a lot here. They're very, very tiny. If any of you have seen the um, ID, kind of plastic credit card, ID cards that we have for GSOP, there's an actual hole punched into it. Um, and it's very, so you can see, but it's very, very tiny. And if you're not specifically looking for it, you most likely won't find it, especially in oak trees with the, the type of bark that they have. So the different management options, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, pretty much no information was known. There was no research or information about this pest when um, it was first discovered. Um, so research took place across everything from biology and its life cycle to how ways that it can be managed. And um, they really focused on an integrated pest management um, type way of, of um, this system for, for managing, um, which included the monitoring, insecticide use, um, a more cultural type management of removal of infested trees or management of um, firewood, and also restoration. Actually. So um, what I really wanted to share with you today is the different resources available to you as master gardeners because you are out in the field and um, meeting with the public at, at, in different ways and in different places than what, say, Forest Service personnel may be at or Cal Fire personnel may be at or other um, larger land manager people. And, um, you know, we've always enjoyed the partnership. I've always enjoyed the partnership I have with you through all of the programs. So there are um, different resources that you can share with the public. Um, in addition to the handouts, such as our trifold brochures that you can take to your events, um, firewood, don't move firewood postcards that you can take to your events. Um, but online, this is um, this uh, website has become kind of the hub of all of our resources. So um, at www.gsob.org, there is on the home page right here. There is a survey that anybody who calls in that maybe suspects their trees may have symptoms of gold spotted oak borer attack. We're just ask, inviting them to go ahead and answer these, this, you know, to partake in this quick survey. And, and they can also upload photos. And that will help the inspectors, the different partners that we have through Forest Service Cal Fire, through University of Riverside, um, to a lot of times they can just diagnose it from photos. So if you get calls about that. This is something we're asking even um, the entomologist, Tracy Ellis, at the Ag Ministers Office. This is a system that, that we're all using. And that's right on the home page. Um, there's also um, field identification guides um, that help people if they're going to be out monitoring that will help them identify, okay, is what level of crown thinning is this and so forth. Is this bark staining pertinent? Um, what's the level of um, or the intensity of the G-sub injury and or attack. So monitoring 
is considered a, um, the best management option for, for early detection is careful monitoring. So I've been working a lot with um, other types of volunteers, um, groups at different parks and reserves that are out and about um, in those areas. Also, um, part of the early warning system is a citizen scientist um, program, if you will, to assist the um, authorities and the agency personnel in the monitoring. So you can actually sign up to be um, an early warning system volunteer. Um, some people, it's been part of their, their professional work, um, the tree care professionals, and they just, they're just going to be on the lookout. They've been trained and they're just going to be on the lookout for this and report it while they're at work, wherever they may be at work. Some are um, property owners, homeowners, and they're just going to look on their property and report. Others are more community-wide. Um, others have been assigned to specific areas. So this is something you may be interested in, or if you get a call, if somebody wants to be more engaged and involved, this is an option. Um, just recently, what was released is um, an app, the GSAW Tracker app for iPads or iPhones that can be used to report directly instead of going through that online system of symptoms, actually do a monitoring of the health of an oak tree. And it's a real simple app. If you um, are interested in this but you don't have the Apple products, um, there is um, the other platforms, there's a different option and it's there on the website as well. And this can all be found under how you can help tab on the front page of the website, the home page of the website. So here's the early warning system and all this information is on that page. Um, also while I'm here, I don't think I have a separate page. Over here is resources. So if you want handouts or um, outreach materials, um, images, um, that can research information, that can all be found there. Or you can find me. <laughs> Um, looking at the different types of traps, colors, and words has been part of the research. Um, they started out with green because that is what has been used most recently with the emerald ash borer. You may have heard of that. It's in the um, northeastern, central northeastern part of the country and decimating their ash populations there. And they have multi-state quarantines for that. Um, so because it's a related species, when they started doing research for gold-spotted oak borer, they followed a lot of the same research protocols that they did for emerald ash borer. Um, but right now they're using these uh, purple traps for you know, the, sticky, the, the sticky traps and um, looking at different areas and heights and placing them around the tree, and that's how they're monitoring it at distances. So diagnosing crown thinning, bark staining, D-shaped emergence holes, and woodpecker foraging. I mentioned that before. And then again, this is another picture of this tree health survey form. So essentially, this um, form, which helps you rate the health of the oak tree, um, was converted to that digital app that I showed you earlier. But if a paper form is preferred, that's still available. So, both systemic and coverage insecticide sprays, um, insecticides, period, um, have been researched. And um, there's nothing finalized as far as a pesticide management strategy. Um, everything that is, that is being mentioned that may help is based on the results from lab surveys in lab research, um, not in the field. They're still conducting that research and monitoring the trees that they are doing these, um, this research on out in the field. So um, what they feel that um, they have enough data now, the researchers at both University of Riverside and through the Forest Service, that um, perhaps coverage spray for, for trees that are considered high value trees. So if you have a really large oak on your property or um, in the city, um, or, or what's considered a high value oak, for whatever reasons, maybe culturally it's, it's important to you, or just aesthetically. Um, and if you're not seeing, if, you, if you're seeing less than 10 exit holes on the tree, then you may consider um, topical or coverage spray. 
but these need to be applied with licensed, state licensed pesticide applicators, the pesticide that you would um, obtain over the counter for homeowners or non-licensed personnel is not going to have the adequate levels to have an impact on the pest. So spraying at early, just to help save trees, um, may help prevent a gold spotted oak borer attack based on feeding assays in the research in the lab. Um, systemic research has not proven to be helpful at all. So really the clever, so you need the proper equipment for that in addition to the licensing. Yes? They're carbaryl, is carbaryl, carbaryl. Um, the other concern with um, the other concern with systemic is the uh, damage that they by by injecting into the tree, the damage that may have also on the tree. So I'm going to zip through this. So managing the infested wood. Um, because of that thick bark, they found larvae still alive in the tree under the bark after it's been cut down for up to two years Ooh. after the bark. So when we say, please don't move firewood, <laughs> please don't move firewood, because even if it's been cut down, that larvae can still be present. It also can be present in the trunks and the roots, the upper roots areas of the tree, that, the stump that's left in the ground. Um, so ways that you can control that is debarking, which is highly intensive hand labor, um, grinding to three inch um, pieces or less, tarping, you can use plastic, that's difficult in um, the areas where there's a, a weather issues, wind issues that can break up the plastic, um, so you can also use screen, really small, fine screening, but it has to be um, well contained. And all that, this will not kill this, the um, insect, but it will help control the populations from getting out. And then seasoning, this is um, Queen Aga State Park. You, know, you just need a lot of space for just leaving it laying there. Um, so this is a problem. Managing your oak fire is a problem. For how long does it have to season? Um, through two, two life cycles. So maybe say two years. Okay. So burning on property is not a good idea? You can burn it, but that's really hard to get uh, permits for burning. Here. Oh yes, you can use it there. But um, if you look at you know, a large size oak, that's a lot of wood, and a lot of homeowners just don't have the space to just leave that wood lying there. Um, so would tree removal programs. Pardon me. Would you have to tarp it if it was? You would have to tarp it even if it was there. We do request that it's being tarped, and that's not biological control. control um, I, I mentioned this. It, it, these species are around in Arizona. They're, they're mites and um, wasps that eat the eggs or attack the bug. Okay. But this. Um, has not been, research has not been effective here for California, and it's a very vigorous, vigorous um, research and process to get approval for release of a new species. I mean, this is with the uh, non-native species as well for California. And um, to my understanding, there's no longer research has been stopped on this, so this is not going to be an option. So don't move firewood is our our big message. Um, and here's that calendar that I mentioned. So the life cycle is on the bottom and the management typing. Um, you know, we put this together to hopefully so you can correlate why you would do certain things. Um, certainly tarping is controlled when they're in the flight season, type of flight, and so forth. Um, in addition to the brochures that I mentioned, the trifle brochures and the postcards that I mentioned, um, these are some really um, publications that have a lot of information on them. And these are also helpful. And then we also have this display. We have two of these displays, tabletop displays. So if you know, the, um, like for instance right now, this is being held at the county building. They're having a multiple species conservation program workshop and update um, for the year, the annual update. And um, so this is on display right now. Like that. That. So if you know of any of this, please let me know. If you'd like to know. We have two of these. We also have Don't Move Fire with pop-up banner. So I know I'm out of time. So see if anybody has If you have any questions, quick questions, yes. How do you address the uh, fire issue? I'm in a fire zone. We just took down ten trees. Oh. I've got I've got more wood than I, I will ever be able to use, and we're in the kind of a drought and fire season. The fire 
company does not want us to have to be that's really tough. You can contact um, the Resource Conservation District in San Diego. They may have programs that can help with the grinding. Regular chippers aren't going to work because the oak is just too hard and large for a, what we consider a vegetation chipper. Um, or contacting uh, a private contractor that can do that kind of grinding. You can use it as mulch. Um, but not right next to your house. <laughs> the wildfire. Okay. Thank you. I'll be around.